Hello, this is Audio Anarchy Radio. We're starting off with a series that introduces a few different concepts from anarchist perspectives. And today we're going to be talking about technology. Uh, The idea isn't to give you a line about what is right and what is wrong, but to explore some of the aspects and critiques of technology that might not be regularly discussed. We have Javier here, who is going to talk over some of the things that he has been thinking about. So, Javier, let me start by asking how you define technology. Well, a dictionary definition of technology is the general term for the processes by which human beings fashion tools and machines to increase their control and understanding of the material environment. Uh, The term comes from the Greek words techne, which refers to an art or craft, and loke, meaning an area of study. So it means the study or science of crafting. For me, I use it to refer to all the tools and machines that humans use to shape, modify, or understand their environment. And do you make a distinction between certain types of technologies or consider technology to be socially neutral? Well, I think each technology, each tool, or each machine should be considered separately. I think each individual technology has different um, social consequences. That I definitely don't think they should be considered neutral for society, but I also don't make too many uh, distinctions or aggrupations in like, oh, good technology, bad technology, or things like that. I just think that we should um, take into consideration each technology individually, notice what characteristics it has, and how it shapes Um, our social institutions and deal with those questions. And what do you think some of the most prevalent, popular, or interesting analyses of technology have been throughout history? Yeah, well, uh, the one that comes to mind, first of all, is uh, Marx. Uh, He uses the term means of production vaguely to what I would refer to as technology. And it's a very central concern for him. Um, However, his analysis of the way in which technology affects social institutions is limited to who controls the technologies or the um, means of production. And he does a class analysis based on this. If the bourgeoisie control the technology or means of production, then uh, we will have a class society. If the proletariat control the means of production, it will be a class of society and stuff like that. Um, I think. Marxists, most Marxists follow this analysis. I also think a lot of other people do. Uh, Anarcho-syndicalists are very influenced by this kind of thought, but others have been a lot more skeptical about this uh, kind of simplistic view of technology. There's been, for example, the um, appropriate technology movement, and more drastically, the anarcho-primitivists definitely think that there's a lot more to technology than just who controls it. And what do you think are popular perceptions or critiques of technology today? Okay, well, I think today some environmentalists do have a certain critique of technology, which is, you know, they question technologies themselves and not who controls it. Um, Their critique or analysis is based purely on environmental aspects and not social that much. And also, I think, in general, today people take technology kind of for granted. And they, they refuse to question it because they think it's kind of like a natural thing for humans to have. There's, I think, a couple of myths that really kind of inhibit our analysis of technology. Um, for example, I would say the myth of progress is a very basic myth. Well, it basically states that humans have never lived in a better situation than today and that they're... they're throughout history continually progressing towards a better state. Things are pretty much getting better. It also pretty much says that progress is inevitable and we can never go back because if we ever try to do something like that then we will eventually advance again back to where we are now. This myth is really annoying to me because it kind of serves the purpose of justifying our current institutions and makes it kind of impossible to criticize technology or a lot of other things that are considered progressive. I can't say there isn't some truth to that, but whether progress has made things better or not is just a matter of personal preference. 
I think a, an important thing to point out, though, is that humanity did not get to its present state of technological or social development by a process of, you know, continual progress. It was not a process of like consensus, democracy, or any other kind of libertarian or um, philosophy or any, you know, practice that really respected individual freedom. I mean, a great amount of cultures were forced to accept specific kinds of agriculture. You know, after imperialism, they were forced to, for example, massively harvest uh, coffee or other products for Europeans. And even some cultures were forced to take on agriculture when they were hunter-gatherers. Other than in the Industrial Revolution, people were taking off, taking off their lands and in a lot of cases chained to machines in order to have the Industrial Revolution really work. So these things that are usually seen as advancements were not so much a product of human ingenuity, but um, in a lot of ways a product of tyranny and oppression. To say that humans naturally developed industrialism and that we can never, that we will always inevitably develop it again if we go back, if we abolish industrialism, is to say that authoritarian institutions are a part of our nature, I think. Another myth that a lot of people take it as truth is that progress and technological progress has as a consequence that we have more leisure. Most anthropologists agree that almost every society that has less, less advanced technology has more leisure time, though. Um, even hunting and gathering provides for more leisure time than farming. Um, however, it's easy to see why some people think that more, or more advanced technology produces more leisure. I mean, a superficial analysis would um, conclude that, you know, pushing a button is easier than doing manual labor. The problem with this analysis is, that is though that it doesn't take to cons into consideration what goes into building the machine that it, you know allows for you to just push the button and the machine does the work for you. For example, um, you know it's less intensive, less labor intensive to drive a car than to walk. But if you take into consideration the labor involved in manufacturing the car, extracting you know from the process of extracting the raw materials extracting the oil produced, you know, for to run in it, to run the factories that build it, extracting the metals to build the car, the, you know, rubber to build the tires, etc. You know, that's a lot more labor intensive than just walking. The thing is that traditionally, I think, um, the distribution of leisure and labor has, you know, favored the ruling class. It hasn't been really distributed equally. Um, some people have to uh, do a lot of labor and pretty much finance the leisure of the ruling class. That's why some people have to work really hard and don't have any cars and some people just go to the, an office building and have the most luxurious cars. So, you know, in that way you can see that it doesn't provide for more leisure to have more technology, at least not necessarily. And so, what are some of your thoughts about technology and how it affects the environment today? Well, definitely, I think this is perhaps the most, or these are the most obvious consequences. Uh, and people, you know, talk about it continually, how cars pollute and stuff like that. I think it's useful, um, useful however, to try to find some general characteristics of technologies that tend to intensify the environmental impact. Um, I will try to mention a few that I think are not as commonly discussed. Um, one of them, one of these uh, general observations, I would say is that technologies that are labor intensive are usually more or have a bigger impact on the environment. Uh, this is because changing the environment is something that requires labor. So the greater the impact usually is because there's more labor involved and required to do this. Also centralization is something that generally increases environmental impact and this is because it concentrates the impact in a small area making it harder for natural mechanisms to repair the damage. I mean most environmental environmentalists are aware of this. Um, 
the environment can modify itself to make impact uh, not as damaging if it's done in a scattered way and not concentrated in one place. Also, technologies that require a homogeneous, persistent human activity increase the impact because they make it harder for nature to slowly adapt. So, I mean, for example, assembly lines come to mind where the, you know, what it's done is continually done, it's like massively done. And this doesn't allow for the environment to adapt to small changes. So an important thing to notice about all these implications is that these kind of activities and technologies are almost exclusively found in authoritarian societies. You know the observations that I made that technologies that are labor intensive, centralized, and homogenized human activity. Um, you know, people, when they're free from many authoritarian institutions, they tend to perform tasks that involve the least amount of labor to achieve. They make decisions in a pretty sporadic manner and decentralized. Uh, and also they like to engage usually in a variety of diverse activities. It's only when coerced that people engage in dangerous and pleasant and labor-intensive activities like mining. And these activities are the ones that have such a great environmental impact. So I think realizing this leads to a very different approach to the problem of environmental des destruction than the one I think most people argue for right now. Like I think most people now argue for more centralized control. You know, the government regulating factories, regulating emissions, you know, more rules for, you know, everything that we do because we can't seem to manage ourselves without causing environmental problems. But this analysis actually states kind of the contrary. It states that humans, when free of authoritarian institutions, produce the less amount of um, environmental impact. So I think, I mean, as an anarchist, I think this is the analysis that, you know, that's more useful from my perspective. Yeah, another thing to notice is that um, advanced technologies tend to have a high environmental impact. What I mean by this is that, well, when I use the term advanced technology, I mean that a technology that depends on previous technologies to function. So, therefore, its total impact becomes not only the impact that the specific technology has, but the added impact of all the technologies that uh, are required for this specific technology. You know, like the examples are, I think, pretty easy to see, like, you know, electrical appliances need energy supply or power supply. And so the power supply has, I mean, you know, like maybe a little electrical appliance doesn't have that much uh, environmental impact, but the whole electrical infrastructure that is needed to power it does. Um, and, you know, different technologies like that. Um, the I think what this analysis leads to is that it doesn't make much sense to make more advanced technology that is supposedly going to be more environmentally friendly. So what are some of your thoughts about the social implications of technology throughout history and today? Okay, and this is, I think, something that is not usually talked about. So I think it's important to consider. Um, okay, so pr technology claims to provide society with tools to achieve its goals. So society, however, is not like a monolithic entity conformed of homogeneous individuals with identical goals. Different individuals in society have different goals and the technologies used will inevitably provide society with tools that serve to achieve the goals of some and not all members. And it also, I mean also, technology is not spread like equally amongst all members of society. It will, it will uh, provide some members of society something while maybe refusing something else to others. So taking this in mind, Let's consider some of the um, implications of technology in society. First of all, organization. Different technologies require for their application different social settings. In terms of centralization or spreading of social activity, technologies can have several implications. If a technology requires for its use many individuals, social activity is centralized around the technology. 
If the technology allows for um, only one or a small number of individuals, it promotes decentralization. So centralization implies that a form of decision making where a single consensus is, has to be reached by the group, not allowing for individuals to reach different decisions or, and be autonomous. In big groups, this phenomenon usually leads to representation or other forms of mediation for the individual to make his or her decisions. So there, there are, you know, an individual's ability to make their decision is taken further and further away from them. To put an example, a factory it can be well, it can be owned by a single boss that has authority over many individuals who work there, or it can be cooperatively owned by the workers. Uh, in any case, each individual will have to adapt his or her schedule to the factories. Uh, they will have to perform the job that the factory assigns, and they will have to receive from their work what the factory decides. Uh, they will have to produce what the factory decides, when it decides, and how it decides. Obviously, cooperative ownership offers the individual worker more of a say in the decisions of the factory than the owner uh, model. But the individuals will never be able to reach a decision that's different from the one assigned by the factory. The individual is alienated from the decision-making process. In the case of the capitalist boss, the alienation is pretty complete, like you don't have absolutely any input into the decision-making. In the case of the worker-owned factory, this alienation is mediated by a process that can be, you know, in different ways. It can range from consensus to some kind of representative democracy, see, or, you know, the level of, let's say, authoritarianism that it can have is, it can be, can vary, but autonomous decision-making is pretty impossible in the context of a factory, whereas other technologies allow for individuals to make their own decisions. Um, okay, another interesting um, aspect is the distribution of technology. Um, proportionally to the energy and labor required for its production, technology becomes a scarcity. The more labor is used to produce a machine, the less number of machines a society can produce. In class societies, this usually implies that the members of the ruling class have access to the technology and the others don't. This causes a widening in the power gap between the classes. The ruling classes are provided with more tools to control their environment and society, and the rest lose this control in the same measure. Uh, another aspect is the shaping of human resources. Um, it's obvious that technology has a profound impact on the educational system of a society. You know, whether the goal of the educational system is to modify the individual so that he can better serve society, or just to provide him and her with the knowledge and skills needed to perform the social roles uh, to provide for themselves. It would also, it would always take into consideration the technology that the society uses. If the technology is very complex and complicated, the educational process will be long. If the technology requires monotonous, centrally organized work, skills like discipline and obedience will be some that are encouraged in the educational process. A point may be reached where the society needs for its survival to produce a certain kind of individual. This will very likely tend to make its educational institutions uh, coercive rather than voluntary. Um, another point is specialization. Certain technologies demand the division of labor in society that tend to produce specializations. This means that certain individuals are required to perform a socioeconomic role, and others are obliged to perform these tasks through this class of specialized individuals. So individuals cannot perform, or uh, individuals that are not specialists cannot perform these tasks by themselves. Our current society has many examples. Uh, individuals need lawyers to legally defend themselves, cops to physically protect themselves, media to be aware of the things that influence our lives, architects to build houses, etc. It is important to note how specialization is not simply an individual having an extraordinary ability, it is the assigning of an individual or individuals to perform a social role and excluding others from performing it. To put an example of a specialist, uh, which is I think a useful example and perhaps the oldest example is the priest. 
In certain societies, it is assumed that the only person or class of persons that can communicate with the deities is a priest. Other individuals are forced to perform this activity only through the priest. In this way, the class of priests effectively control at least the spiritual aspect of the society, and often this is used to also control other aspects, like the moral standards and other taboos and customs of the society. So that, that obviously has uh, enormous like power consequences on the power relations relationships of the society. Um, there's different ways in which specialized roles are imposed or assigned. Um, for example, some roles, for some, you know, to perform certain things, you need a diploma, a certificate, or some kind of authorization from appropriate authority to perform it. Uh, technology works in a different way to assign these roles. Um, by increasing in complexity, technology has become impossible to be wholly understood understood by an individual and individuals have to specialize in a particular aspect of the technology and depend on others to specialize in the rest. And, you know, when this happens, everybody loses their autonomy and their ability to perform jobs by themselves. Another important consequence, uh, social consequence of technology is uh, the creation of environment. Every technology, as we have said before, is um, essentially a modification of the environment. From an environmental point of view, this implication you know, has obvious consequences, but it's also very relevant from a social point of view. Uh, some relevant questions are, you know, who gets to modify the environment for others, or for who do they, whose environment do they modify, and how do these modifications impact the lives, the lives of the individuals that live there? Uh, to me, the issue of empowering versus disempowering environments is noteworthy. Certain environments provide each individual with the means for his or her subsistence uh, in a quite egalitarian way. If each individual is able to access the resources they need to survive in an autonomous way, then this is an empowering environment. But other environments uh, do quite the opposite. Uh, for example, modern urban environments pretty much eliminate all the resources from our environment and the ability to access the, res the resources that we uh, need to survive is pretty much denied. So, um, you know, the modern, er modern urban environment pretty much puts resources in the hands of a few people and then all the rest of the people have to have has to acquire these resources through monetary exchanges. Uh, the individual is forced to participate in the social, economic, and political institutions set before him or her to be able to have access to the ex to the resources needed to survive. With the impossibility of directly accessing resources, one has to acquire money, which is um, the modern socially imposed means to access resources in order to survive. And then those who control the money, have the most of it, effectively control both the resources and the individuals who want access to those resources. Uh, in Ivan Illich's words, modernized poverty deprives those affected by it of their freedom and power to act autonomously, to live creatively. It confines them to a survival through being plugged into market relations. The opportunity to experience personal and social satisfaction outside the market is thus destroyed. I am poor, for instance, when the use value of my feet is lost because I live in Los Angeles or work in the 35th floor. Uh, mediation and autonomy. Uh, direct action is, commonly used, is a commonly used word in radical circles. It is usually considered an anarchist value. The reasoning goes that if to achieve our goals we must go through others, then we are not in direct control of our lives. We're not in direct control of the consequences of our actions. And so mediated action is the opposite of direct action. Um, autonomy increases as mediation decreases. Technology is always a medium through which we interact with our environment. Uh, a medium through which accom we accomplish our goals and access our resources. So the same reasoning applies here. Uh, to increase autonomy, we must decrease mediation or decrease technology. This is especially true when technology also implies a social mediation. 
when the technologies we use and we, the technologies we need to perform our activities are controlled by others, uh, then our actions are not only mediated by material objects, but they're also mediated by social institutions, which we might not like, and which, in effect, can become quite controlling of our actions. So as a conclusion, I would say that the implications that technology has go well beyond its stated purposes. Uh, by this I mean that, you know, like, if a technology says that it will just transport people, like cars, for example, well, the consequences are, yes, that it transports cars, but also that we need uh, streets. Um, it also implies that not everybody's going to have access to cars because they are very labor-intensive, and so therefore a class of people that can own cars will uh, exist and one that doesn't have access to cars, uh, etc. An important thing to notice is that all the implications that I found are inherent in the technology itself and do not depend on who controls or uses the technology. Only by being aware of all the implications that technologies have will we be able to make the decisions that will help us achieve the society we desire. That's it for today's introduction to a critique of technology. Check out Audio Anarchy on the web, audioanarchy.org.